Welcoming today Professor Josh T. Davis. He's a chartered psychologist and an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society. He has worked at the University of Greenwich since 2008. Since 2020, as a professor in applied psychology, his PhD was on the forensic identification of unfamiliar faces in closed caption TV images. And he has since published over 30 articles on human face recognition and eyewitness identification, the reliability of facial composite systems, methods used by expert witnesses to provide evidence of identification in court, and juror decision-making in crimes involving sexual assault and rape. Um, there's much more to his CV if you visit his page on the uh, University of Greenwich. We uh, welcome Dr. Josh Davis. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, what I will do is put my slides up on screen so you can see what I see and hopefully you will be seeing my first PowerPoint slide. Could somebody just confirm? That yes. Good, excellent. So um, yes, I, I'm Josh Davis um, and I've, I've sort of left my contact details there. If anybody who is watching a recording of this wants to contact me to ask me some questions then I'm very happy for you to do so. And uh, moving on. So this is actually where I work, University of Greenwich. It's right, it's about five miles from London, centre of London, and right by the River Thames. And before where these buildings were was uh, Henry VIII's palace. It was his favourite palace called Placentia. And that's where sort of, um, sort of Anne Boleyn and all his six wives used to live. And it's also a sort of it's always always been an area of science because right on the top of the hill is the Royal Observatory. And that's where, um, a, a, you know, a lot, the, the Astronomer Royal used to live, who was the sort of most senior astronomer. Lots of uh, very famous um, astronomers have lived there. And it's also, if you like, the centre of time because it's where the meridian line goes through. So if you step on one side of the line, you're in the Eastern Hemisphere. On the other side of the line, you're in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and because of Greenwich being where it was, it was the headquarters of the Royal Navy. That's why the Meridian was set there. Um, I should say there's a there used to be a nuclear reactor in one of the buildings that you can see in front of you. And also um, uh, Lord Nelson, who won the Battle of Trafalgar, was laid in rest before he was gave, given a state funeral uh, by going in a... Um, on a boat along the river. So it's an absolutely fascinating centre of history in the United Kingdom. So I'm going to talk about super recognisers, talk about some of my work mainly with the Metropolitan Police in, the, in London, um, where they developed a, a super recognizer unit. And in fact, there are a number established now around the world, but this was the first. And really, we sort of came up with parameters. How can we deal with people who've got absolutely unbelievable face recognition ability? And I'm going to show you some examples of what they can do. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science and then sort of computer face recognition systems. So what is a super recognizer? James Rabbit was the person you saw in the video, and he was at the time um, a Metropolitan Police ser Service officer, and he worked in New Scotland Yard's Super Recognisers Unit. And he's identified well over a thousand suspects from CCTV images. Um, and mainly, he's never met them before. And what's key is that James, uh, in that particular video you saw, um, we were sort of positioned up on the balcony and he looked at those photographs for about five seconds. And then we just waited because the BBC had to move their cameras into different positions in the station so that they could follow my students as they were. And James and me couldn't see what the cameras were looking at. And basically, my, my, my students just went to pretend to buy a ticket from the ticket machine or some, something like that. The BBC sort of set up their movements. And two of my students had worked for me for over a year, and James spotted them first in those crowds. Um, I actually got the other two, who I didn't know quite so well, 
only because I happened to be watching just the right direction as they walked into the, the field of view. But I was absolutely astonished James did that. Um, uh, Monica, the, the woman who changed her hair colour, actually bought a brand new hair shade the night before to dye her hair just to try and trick him. He's never met her before, obviously. It's very impressive. And, and James also, because he was inundated with CCTV images all the time. Basically, all the images from across London went into the super recognizer unit, all crime scene images that were um, had unidentified people in them. And quite often, James would be going home from work or something, catching the train, and there is somebody on the wanted list. So he'd have to go back on duty and, and arrest that person because, of course, they were, they were wanted. Um, and it, it, it is quite astonishing. I mean, uh, w when they do it, and I'll give you some hope to you'll see what I mean as we go through this talk. So my PhD finished in 2007, and this was on the forensic identification of unfamiliar faces from CCTV. Most of my research was done at London Science Museum, and I was very lucky because it just happened to be at the same time as a very big uh, exhibition was going on uh, linked to Star Wars. And, and it was the busiest that London Science Museum has ever been in the entire history of its existence. It was built by um, Queen Victoria's husband, Albert. And so thousands of people were actually queuing up to take part in my research. And the basic take home message was that even if you have really high quality CCTV images and there's no memory involved, you're not asking people to say, oh, I recognise that person, purely doing what, say, a passport officer or an identity ver verification person might do by uh, looking at your passport, uh, looking at you and going, yeah, that's the same person or that's not the same person. That's what we were doing. And our my take-home story from my whole PhD, three years of it, was that people are basically rubbish at doing that. So uh, about... Two and a half years ago, uh, two and a half years later, three years later, I went to a conference and the Metropolitan Police's uh, a, a, a senior detective who had just been put in charge of managing all of uh, London CCTV footage was giving a conference speech. And he was basically talking about what changes he was putting in place. And he'd set up a, a court on camera website where they were putting all the unsolved crime images up onto this website with the hope that police officers mainly, but members of the public as well, could spot these people and go, oh, I know that person is my next door neighbour, that sort of thing. And what he was finding was that it was the same very small group of about 25 police officers who were making about more than a quarter, about a third of all the identifications across London. There are 30,000 plus police officers all were supposed to be looking at this website. So I went up to him at this conference after his talk and sort of said, oh, I've finished a PhD in your sort of area. Is there any research that I could be doing that could help your activities uh, to, to make it better? And he said, well, I've got these guys who keep making all these identifications. And this was before the term super recognizer had ever been invented or designed or anything. And, and and I sort of went, oh, well, yeah, it's the police telling me they've got these really good police officers. I was very, very sceptical because I'd done a PhD three years telling me that people were rubbish at identification from CCTV. So I thought it was about motivation or the people making the identifications were basically identifying sort of cr criminals that they may know really well and they just might have more contact with the type of criminal who gets caught on CCTV. So I didn't think it was any exceptional ability whatsoever. And in a way, I sort of almost went out to prove that as my hypothesis, whereas he thought he had really good face recognition ability. He was right. I was wrong. Take home story, basically. And some of them were absolutely exceptional. And I'll give you some examples as we go through. And in fact, James wasn't in that first group. Uh, James came in a bit later when we tested him. Um, four months later, the London riots happened. And I know you've had riots recently, and I'm sure riots probably look the same the world over. Um, but these were criminal riots, very much so. They were less do with protesting about political events. Uh, at one point, it became very obvious that it was gang-led and people were rioting to steal stuff, effectively. 
So it's slightly different for some of uh, the riots that you've had to some degree. But of course, the same thing happened. Everyone's in disguise. No one, you know, only an idiot rioter is going to, you know, put their name on their head. So it's a real problem. You can see some photographs from here that they had to identify. What happened was those people that we identified as being quite good um, were, were, were part of the operation. They actually had about 600 officers across London working for two years on these riots. Um, and they had 200,000 hours plus of footage. Um, and in the end, they distributed about 5,000 images and 4,000 people were charged. Almost all of those were from ID, from uh, CCTV footage. There wasn't any other evidence. Unless people were arrested at the scene of the crime, it was CCTV footage. But the 20 super recognisers who we'd identified as being really good, identified 600 of the rioters. One identified over 180. Nearly all of the other identifications were sort of one-offs. A, a police officer going, oh, that's a guy I arrested last year or something like that. Key was the best computer system in the world. In fact, the Metropolitan Police went and purchased it, especially for the riots investigation. It identified one suspect. And a super recogniser, as we were calling them by then, had already identified that suspect. So why? Because the type of footage you get at riots is cameras on poles. Um, it was dark. It was smoky. There was lots of um, smoke bombs being sent to the police and things like this. Um, the camera views are bad. You're getting the tops of people's heads. So computer systems do not work very well in those circumstances. They are getting better. But they're not, um, certainly not replacing humans. Humans can see body movement and get other cues from um, footage. And then humans can follow people back through different scenes. Most people confessed, 75% plus, confessed when they were shown um, multiple images of themselves. Why? Well, it's very hard to deny in a police interview. Excuse me, sir. Um, um, so what were you doing last Wednesday night? Oh, well, I was staying at home. I was scared. I was watching the riots on television. Um, how do you account for this photo and this photo and this photo? And look, this one, this person takes off their their um, their hoodie. And, you know, it looks remarkably like you at the end of your street because, of course, they could follow them back the streets. But they got a very high conviction rate um, from this. And for me, this is the most impressive. This is one of the identifications from a, piece, a police constable, Gary Collins. He's the guy who identified over 180. And this person is in disguise, as you can see. Um, and the CCTV operator knows he's causing trouble. So he's following him through the footage. And, and this guy's just taken a photograph of him. And that's the best image that they got of his front of his face. And Gary Collins had arrested him some time before, and he recognised him from that image. Now, in all the tests that we've done at the time, up until about 2015, Gary came top in every face recognition test we ever threw at him. Um, and there's another one uh, with a guy in disguise. And, the, the, you know, the one that you saw uh, committing arson got six years in prison for that. So... Um, after the riots, a couple of years later, we set up some tests on the Metropolitan Police website for more police officers to have a go. We thought we'd do some pilot testing first to test them out. Um, we thought, yes, yeah, so, so get about 50 people to take part. And in fact, 1,500 police took the series of tests that we put together. And we identified about 20 super recognisers in that programme, including James Rabbit, the guy you saw at the train station. And really what we do now, we, we still do the same tests, but we've updated most of them. And they measure these different factors to do with face recognition. So how good are you at recognising someone a short time later, a long time later? Also doing sort of simultaneous face matching tasks, which is the task that, as I said, path force officers might do when checking your identity. And one of the first things that happened after that was... Um, in 1989, um, 96 people had died at a, a football stadium, a soccer stadium, as you say, in Hillsborough, in, in Leeds. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a scandal. 
It was a, a political cover-up to some degree. And the, the government of 2014 decided that they would hold a, an inquest 25 years later, basically, into what went wrong. And in fact, there was some, the police made a number of mistakes and sent um, the crowd which into areas that was already packed as they arrived at the stadium and people crushed. They got crushed because a barrier cra- uh, broke and people fell over and then people fell on top of them. So 89 people died. And for 25 years, um, there's, there was really good quality TV footage. The um, victims, the police, have been trying to spot all of the victims in the CCTV footage and in the TV footage by going through it sort of frame by frame, looking at the whole scene. As you can imagine, it's an absolutely crowded stadium. It was one of the big occasions for uh, British um, soccer, uh, the FA Cup semi-final, if anyone's ever heard of that. So, um, and so they wanted to build these timelines. And so when the government announced a new inquest, um, a different police force were putting in charge of the investigation, and they had 10 people working on it for about 10 months. And they'd found about 76 of the 96 who died in various clips. And they heard about super recognizers on the, in the media, and they asked me, do I think that they might be able to help with this investigation to find the other victims? And what happened was we, 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 we decided that two of the highest scorers on our tests and two of the most successful at identification from CCTV, from that caught on camera website, would be invited to go along and look at the footage. And on the very, so what they, they showed us some really harrowing, I mean, it's the worst footage I've ever seen in my life um, of, of, of basically people sort of dying and, and being crushed to death. And on the very first day, they said, well, we'll show you this. And, and to the police, you can excuse yourself if you feel this is going to be too harrowing for you. We all get psychological assessed every week because of the trauma associated with needing to look at this footage. Um, They also showed them some images of the missing 20 people they'd not been able to find for 25 years. And um, and they showed them some of the clips. And one of the super recognisers within five minutes goes, is this a trick? Well, Why? Because, look, there's one of the people you've not been able to find for 25 years. And so the sort of police officers who've been involved in this investigation were very sceptical, a bit like me, as I mentioned before. You know, met police from London coming here, trying to tell us how to do our job. And they just stood there, mouth open, because they went, oh, it is one of them. How? How? We've just not missed that person. And it was a really good quality image. And from that, they, they identified all 96 and it actually turned the original inquest decision from sort of death by misadventure. So they did a great job uh, here. And in fact, whereas the families were very anti-police because of the police errors in the stadium, uh, they were writing letters to these super recognisers, thanking for them for their help in actually building a timeline so that their loved one could be given a, if you like, a, a proper understanding that everything that happened to them was not their fault. It was, um, you know, the police unfortunately opening the wrong stadium door, letting people into the wrong area. So what happened then? Well, the Metropolitan Police set up this super recognizer unit. And really, it was just a small group who came, who scored really highly on these tests. And they were given lots of images of um, criminals, sorry, un, 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 unidentified criminals to see if they could work out who they might be. They all have already had a, a big database of all images of unsolved crimes stored on a database. And very quickly, they were sort of saying, oh, I've seen that guy before in another bit of footage. And then going back to that other footage and working out that it was one and the same person and building up these sort of chains and portfolios, if you like, of, of evidence against different people. They also had um, super recognisers we identified who didn't want to work in a unit. They just wanted to do their job. And they were given priority viewings of all crimes that happened in their area on the basis that you're more likely to know who the sort of local criminals are than you are from the other side of London. Major successes. Thousands of um, people were identified. Um, and I mean, 
I'm going to sort of give you an example here. This person was um, catching buses, and our buses all have, uh, across London, uh, they all have cameras on. And he was sexually assaulting very young girls on buses and sort of hiding his hands under a newspaper. And he'd been um, travelling around London on what we call an Oyster card, which is a sort of swipe-in travel card. You pay your payments in advance, but you can have an anonymous one, so nobody knows who you are. So the police worked out, well, he's been in those three places. Only one, only one card has been used on those three buses. It must be the same person. And um, they decided, oh, yesterday, look, he was at this um, particular train station. We know there's really good CCTV. So they went to that train station and one of the super recognisers goes, oh, there he is. And he was there across the crowded concourse. It was a rush hour, a bit like Waterloo probably looked. And he actually, it may have been even more busy. And so they arrested him and, and he actually confessed. For me, what was key was that this guy, uh, that the super recognizer who identified him was one of the people we identified through our, our tests. She ne had no idea she was any good at face recognition at all. In fact, we had a sort of um, super recognizers day at New Scotland Yard where they're all invited and we had a bit of a fun face recognition quiz at the end. And, um, and I read out the results for that fun quiz in, you know, third place is this, second place is uh, this officer. And she sort of from the back of the room goes, me? How can I be second? Uh, and she was. And so... Um, and the first person was Gary Collins, the guy who did the 180 rioters. So we have this sort of evidence that you could use these people in heinous crimes and also in operations involving identification of victims. Uh, here's a, um, one of their big successes. As I said, they were um, identifying people who um, were making multiple crimes. Uh, committing multiple crimes across London in different areas. And in the past, none of them would have been linked together. And, and this guy um, is uh, quite openly brazen about his shoplifting. And you can see, uh, you sort of get the impression that the shopkeeper's probably aware that there's something funny going on here because she's definitely looking at him, but she can't be sure. And he was going into different, very expensive shops. These are not cheap clothes, you see. And I think he must have the widest trousers in the world because, <laughs> pants in the world, as you say, because he's stuffing them down his, these expensive uh, shirts or whatever and obviously just leaving the building. And because these are in different parts of London, they've never have been linked. And also, shoplifting is not considered that serious. And so it's not a priority for police. This is um, probably about $10,000 worth of jewellery just going in his pocket there. And, of course, they find out on a, you know, when they do their stock take that there's something missing. This is obviously stealing to order because this is an art exhibition. And he's stealing some sort of statue that's as long as his leg. And he must have put it down <laughs> by his leg as well. So um, it's... They sort of spotted him. It's one of the first they got. He'd committed 42 offences. He got five years in prison. Nobody gets five years for shoplifting. You know, it's normally a slap on the wrist and, and because it's normally one case. And in fact, it's it, it, the way he reacted, the police officers involved thought he'd be made hundreds and hundreds of similar offences. Um, you may have heard of this case. These are two Russian spies. And this Novichok poison is a nerve poison. And they um, planted it in, um, in Salisbury um, in the southwest of England uh, to try and kill uh, two um, dissidents from Russia, basically escaping from Vladimir Putin, um, enemies of him. And uh, unfortunately, a, a woman died. Um, who wasn't anything to do with the Russians. They happened to put the poison down and she seems to have touched it. And two other people, including a police officer, were seriously ill. The police officer, Young, has had to retire um, and, and because it, it's, it's a very ill from this Novichok poisoning. But um, because it was obviously they were targeting these two Russians, they realised that because one of the Russians became very ill from the poisoning, 
The super recognisers were charged with looking at all the CCTV evidence from this town, Salisbury, and then watching every single plane, uh, the footage of every plane coming in at the airports prior to when this poisoning happening. And so when they were going through the checkouts and things like that, they spotted the two spies. And the, what, what was it? Well, I've seen those two before. So what you've got to imagine is Salisbury's quite a large town. There's an awful lot of people in that footage. It's not, it's not, it could have been women, it could have been younger people, it could have been older people. And they're just watching all this footage from this town. And then later, they just happen to watch the footage from the airports. And they're going, those two, I've seen them before. And then from that, they could work out who they were from passports and things like that. And basically, these two admitted being in Salisbury at the time of the, um, of the murder, but they didn't admit to the murder. But they were KGB officers at one time. Um, so they've worked in other places, um, in uh, uh, sort of almost stopping um, pickpockets at pop concerts. Notting Hill Carnival is one of the biggest in the world. One million people go there every year. And they work in control rooms to sort of spot people who are banned, who in the past have uh, been drug dealers or committed violence acts or something, sort of not quite high enough crimes to sort of go to long-term prison, but enough to be banned from ever going again. Um, and also I've been at Munich Police with Oktoberfest, which is a massive beer festival, and other places as well. What about the science? Well, I thought I'd, I'd, it's always a bit difficult to do this sort of thing online, but I hope you enjoy the next little section of this talk. So first research was actually done in, in, in Harvard, in, um, in the USA, on super recognizers. And in fact, they coined the term super recognizer. So there, the researchers there, Russell et al., they mainly studied people called with, people with prosopagnosia, which is the absolute opposite of super recognition. Um, prosopagnosics are um, basically can't even see, recognize their family members if it's really severe. Some people have developmental prosopagnosia. They never get the ability to do so. Um, and some people um, regain prosopagnosia after suffering some sort of brain damage. They used um, the Cambridge face memory test. And if you go on our website and you take our tests, you will see these stimuli. You can have a go at it. It's, um, it's, it's quite good fun. And it's still used by, by psychologists as a, as a reliable measure of face recognition. They also had a couple of others, but one of them was a before they were famous test. Now, normally, if it was a, me and a, with an audience, I would ask you to uh, put your hands up and tell me who you think these people are. So I'm just going to show you and get you to think about this. So I'm going to show you some people before they were famous. In fact, their children, all the people you see are Hollywood actors. So have a think about who this person may be. And if I'm in a room of super recognisers giving this talk, there's a race. The hands all go up almost immediately, um, almost without fail. And in fact, I normally use harder um, faces because these they find too easy. Brad Pitt um, is the first one. Um, and, and actually Brad Pitt, I'm told, is a prosopagnosic. Um, I don't know how bad his prosopagnosia is, but he's not very good at recognising other people. Um, this person, um, I'm not sure how well you can see me, but his hairstyle now looks remarkably similar to mine. There you go. Um, this one, most people find a little bit easier. I should say these aren't the stimuli from the original test. These are just ones that um, have got, uh, I can't remember what the copyright that you can show, anybody can show at any time um, on the internet. So this person has put this image up and here we go, Britney Spears. And as I said, if it's the super recognizers, it, it's, it's a race it's almost a race not to be last because everybody gets them. Um, and, and this very final one. And some people look at the lips and go, oh, yeah, I know who that is. And um, that sort of tells me that it's very unlikely. I don't know how old she is in the image in the left, but I can't think she's more than about, she's certainly not 10, um, that her lips aren't um, cosmetic is one way of putting it. 
Um, so what do we think? Well, we know that prosopagnosia, developmental prosopagnosia, is about 2% of the population seem to have that um, inability. It's a bit of a statistical measure, really. It's a, it, it's a circular argument about how many in the population really do have it. But when we first started this, we thought, um, well, maybe super recognisers, just the other end of this sort of normal distribution of ability. Most of us are sort of in the middle. So whether it's height, I'm very tall, I'm six foot five. So, you know, and height, I'd be on that right hand side of the, the scale here. Somebody who was five foot five, a man anyway, would be on the left left hand side of the scale. Most of us are somewhere near the middle. And then you've got some extreme basketball players, perhaps, who are in the far right and, and others who are on the far left. We know prosopagnosia is inheritable. So we thought, well, maybe super recognisers are. It's, it's a genetic effect as well. And we've also done some EEG studies. And this is me just proving that I take part in my um, PhD students um, um, research. Uh, and, and to sort of put it, cut, cut a long story short, because it's quite complex. We found different levels of activity in the super recognisers in our sample versus the controls in our sample. So, um, and it was in play, it was in activity at times that you wouldn't have expected from face recognition. It's a bit um, complex to explain. What about the genetic link? Well, because if we can say, oh, there's some brain stuff going on that is different when they look at faces, maybe this genetic link has got something there for, that something in the brain that is, 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 is causing it. And so we did, um, uh, well, the first study to look at um, sort of a large scale study looking at face recognition ability was um, this one, Shakes, Graf and Pluin, and they measured identical twins. And what they found was that identical twins of all abilities tended to have similar scores on tests far more similar than non-identical twins. And that's a very strong indicator of some sort of genetic influence going on. Um, we also have tested, we've done another experiment just this year, um, looking at um, parents and their children. And actually, we find quite a strong correlation between parents and their children when they're above 13 years, but a much weaker correlation when children are under 13 years. What you've got to remember is unlike identical twins where identical twins have 100% of the genes shared. Um, um, children only get 50% from one parent, 50% from the other parent. So it's always going to be a weaker correlation than with, the, with identical twins. But we do find that correlation. We also found that um, sort of life experiences have a, has an effect as well. And other research has found that um, people who come from large cities tend to have better face recognition ability as adults than people who grew up in small towns. And so it seems to be there's some sort of um, uh, contact as uh, well that's going on. But what's quite important is the difference between familiar and unfamiliar faces. Um, so most people are pretty good at recognising people you know. Otherwise, it would be a real problem for all of us. Um, to diagnose you can imagine it's, it's not a nice problem to have. Um, but it varies substantially. But what with what we find with super recognisers is actually they're good at recognising unfamiliar faces as well. Just like James Parrot in that very first James Rabbit in that first video I showed. Showed. So if you just so I want you to think about these faces. Now you know who he is. Whatever political um, opinion you have, you recognise Bill Clinton immediately in all of those images. And yet, just look at the variation in those images. How white his skin looks in some, how brown, orange, I don't know, looks in other, his hair colour changes. Um, on the bottom left one, he's got long hair. Others, he's decades older. Um, and yet, instantly, you see Bill Clinton with that no effort whatsoever, despite all that variation. And I'm hoping you all know who Tom Hanks is. And you may have seen this on the Internet. It was a bit of an Internet meme of some time ago. Um, and what I want you to do is tell me, apart from the fact Tom Hanks, not very good with babies. Uh, what's wrong with Tom? Uh, if you know this, you probably know the answer. But the actual answer is it's quite clever because um, it's actually Bill Murray. And... 
because I primed you with who it is, not basically, <laughs> I lied, um, uh, or at least I, 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 I was slightly uh, d- deceiving you. Um, people, even super recognizers, actually, quite often don't realize that they're identifying the wrong person. So even super recognizers are not perfect at this task. And then I always show these images and ask you, these are unfamiliar to you. Have a look and think how many people you can see, how many dif- different people. Um, um, this all sort of comes from a study. Um, and what they did was actually they printed out the photographs and people had to put participants had to put them into piles based on which ones go together as the, being the same person. And um I mean, I, you know, I have no idea what you think, but I can tell you now that the mean number of piles that were produced was nine. So the average person thought there were nine different people, whereas the true answer is two. And now I know one of the two people. So for me, I can sort of work out who the second is. But there are a few images that I'm not 100 percent sure because it could be the person I know reasonably well enough to sort of meet at conferences and things like this and one of the reasons is um this comes from a chapter we wrote it's about the distortion that you get from faces go back to bill clinton and all the the sort of um skin tone and all that changed but in those black and white images it's also how far a camera is from the subject and actually it's easier to see this distortion when I show you images like this than it is to see the distortion if I show you photographs of people the same person because actually your brain tries to um, almost uh, compensate for the, the sort of the, the face being so much wider in one image than another and the ears being larger and the nose all changing It's quite an effect. And that's a problem because, of course, these changes do change appearance. And computer systems, they partly measure texture. But think of texture and Bill Clinton. They partly measure the size of the face on the screen. And you can see here there is a difference. And it fools computers and it fools humans. So who do we work with? So we work with lots of um, police forces around the world. And we sort of set up these tests. These are the tests that we did for the Metropolitan Police. So if you wanted to have a go, this is what I'm really saying here, is they're on our website. You're very welcome to see. There'll be a link at the end of this talk. Um, But we measure sort of short-term unfamiliar face recognition, simultaneous matching, uh, long-term unfamiliar face recognition, also spotting faces in a crowd. And, and, uh, and, and you know, sort of because it's, it's academia, there's always academia, academic criticism when you're doing this. And so some people are saying, oh, but you're measuring other things. They're not just face recognition. And we go, yeah, we are. Because if you're going to find police officers to do these jobs, they need these other skills as well. They need to be good at vigilance, concentration, attention on the task in hand. They need to be motivated to actually do this type of job. Um, and we have multiple multi-ethnic faces and faces in our tests of different ages. Um, and one of the key things that we try to measure is the ability to recognise faces that you've seen before. You recognise a criminal, that's great. Actually, and this is key to what we do, It's actually the ability to know that you've not seen a face before might be in some circumstances more important than the first skill. Because if you keep identifying the wrong person, um, not realising that you've never seen that person before, that could lead to, you know, the wrong leads, could lead to miscarriages of justice, wrongful convictions, because, you know, the police have a uh, an identification of somebody that's a little bit weak, but then they find some circumstantial evidence and it seems to build up into a package of evidence against that person. If you stop that dead, if you stop only have people who are who are likely not to make that mistake, then you're far, you, people have far greater trust in the criminal justice system in general. Uh, and for me, and as I'll say at the end, one of the things that if you're going to use computer face recognition systems that some people think are marvellous, other people are very anti, I'm neutral on the political angle, but I say you should have a super recogniser working with them so that when the computers do make mistakes, and they do, 
a super recognizer is more likely to stop that mistake going any further. Uh, and in fact, there are super recognizers we found jobs for who do just that. So we got lots of clients, as I said, lots of different police forces. Uh, almost every week at the moment, in, in let's say the last three months since sort of lockdown in Europe are, are, are stopping, um, I'm getting a week. I'm getting a, a police force every week emailing me and say, "Can we do a, con a, a project with you?" Big one missing from here is the United States of America. I have spoken to police forces, and um, they want the technology. That's how I see it. They're really keen on the face recognition systems. They're less keen on uh, humans doing it. And fair enough, that's that's their decision. They're, 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 they're your police force, not mine. Um, but as I said, if I if I was making selections, at least if you're going to use the systems, I would um, have a, 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 an operator. I think I've got a Washington Post article coming out uh, soon interview with me. Um, I was hoping it would be before this we could advertise it, but it um, doesn't look like it's going to come out um, until for another couple of weeks. And so the last one, I talked about spotting faces in a crowd. And basically, this is what that first video did I showed you with um, James Rabbit. It's like a missing person exercise, really. We show people photographs of people wearing clothes they'd never wear if they went missing. Their wedding dress, for instance. And because that's what victims' families, missing persons' families, always give the police. They give them the Facebook profile photos, the nice ones where they're all smiling. And of course, if someone's got lost or something like that or suffered some sort of mental disturbance, it's very unlikely that they're going to be in the same state. And but very hard for the police to then say, actually, no, can we have bad quality photographs of your loved one? Doesn't really work on a PR level. So we try to replicate it. What about research? So as I said, we put our tests up on the internet. If you want to have a go, you can have a look on the superrecognizers.com website, but also there's a link here. And, and this particular test, the very first one that we always put up, has been taken it's almost 7 million people now around the world. Um, and then lots of people sign up to do our research. I think there's, there's, there's a good 5,000, 6,000 people on our database from the United States, actually. And some of them are super recognisers. Some of them are police super recognisers, but they don't work as a super recognisers in the police. They're just very good at identification. We're also testing um, voice recognition. I've got a PhD student who's nearly finished now who finds that super recognisers of faces tend to be better on average than super uh, than uh, uh, voices as well. Not all of them, but in, in there are some who are absolutely exceptional. And we've um, tested voice artists, uh, people who um, do cartoon voices and things like that, and, and some of them are exceptionally good as well. Um, so what sort of research? Here's a, here, some very contemporary research. This was published in the Royal Society, um, it was founded by uh, uh, Isaac Newton and people like that a long time ago. So their journal, quite a nice one. Face mask. Does wearing a face mask make you worse at recognising someone? And are super recognisers affected as much as controls? Take home story is, yes, you wear a face mask. It reduces your identification ability about as much as, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> you're trying to identify someone with a face mask. It's about the same as sunglasses, basically. It does reduce everyone's ability, but super recognizers are still far better than controls. Super recognizers are better than controls, um, even when the, the the controls are watching faces with no face mask or with no sunglasses. What about this one? This is you might actually this is one you probably can't show. Um, record on the on the YouTube. <laughs> But um, just give you an idea. So the, 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 if you like, the plot of Mission Impossible is fake masks. And they are used by fraudsters. Um, there's one on the left here. Uh, there's a white guy wore a, a black face mask. And the police were searching for a black suspect for a long time. Uh, this guy was uh, fraudulently gaining money from people who he looks like the foreign minister of 
a, for, a minister in the government of France and people believed him when he was contacting them over Zoom or whatever, saying, trying to extract charity money from them and people gave him money. Um, so we wanted to see, well, a super recognizer is better at doing that. So we set up a, a mock uh, border control exercise. All we did was show people photographs with the background of border control. Um, imagine this person comes through your, um, your system. Um, would you let them in? Do they look suspicious or not? So here's the mission impossible bit. And um, people, there's no information whatsoever about them at all. And um, they had, was it 30? Yeah, nearly 40 trials. Some of them were real faces. Some of them were uh, face masks. And it was all um, randomised. So it was an implicit detection. No cues at all. And super recognisers were better. We had two groups of controls. And I'm not going to go into what they were. But basically, super recognisers were better at spotting the people wearing the face masks. This is the hit. So a hit means... They identified someone as wearing a face mask as being suspicious, shouldn't be let into the country, is one way of thinking about it. Unfortunately, they also, if you look at the next column, second column, they're also actually making slightly more um, uh, rejections of real people. So saying, oh, this person looks suspicious. He shouldn't be let in the country for whatever reason. And in fact, they, were, uh, they weren't wearing a face mask. Uh, and... It is quite interesting that. So it basically says that perhaps super recognisers are more cautious. These other these other measures sort of measure some of that. And I won't go into that. So the left one was hit. Yeah, that person's suspicious. And they get it right because he is wearing a face mask. Next, second column is uh, um, false alarms because they're being suspicious about someone who's entirely innocent. That's a problem, of course. Um but then we did a second path for the same people and we actually gave them some information about these hyper face masks and what they look like. And um, well, then we showed them the same trials again and they had to decide whether they'd let them in or not. And what we found this time when super recognisers were told, well, everyone was told the accuracy rate for super recognisers was still significantly higher. And actually, we made far fewer false alarms. So... That the biggest effects were the false alarms one. So there's a big advantage here for using super recognizers. And just to give you an idea, some of some people have got through passport control in real life wearing those masks with fake passports at the same time. So it does happen. Um, you can imagine it's quite um, it, it's not going to be your poor criminals who do this. We also looked at research to replicate the Grary Collins identification where someone's wearing something over their face and you show somebody some, a video like this and for about a minute and then a week later you ask them to see if they can identify this person from a lineup and we had different conditions different disguise conditions here it's all the same person and this is the lineup, and there were nine people in it. This is how they show identity parades in the UK. They're all on video. You see one person at a time. This is the person you just saw earlier. And yes, this can be shown on the internet because I, um, this guy's given me full permission for this. And um, the super recognizers far better at identifying the uh, that guy than the controls, even when. He was wearing that balaclava. Maybe the shape of the head comes through, something like that. But it was a week later, and they were, um, and it was far better than sort of guessing or anything like that. Um, what about the final things then? So, face recognition systems—they are getting better. Uh, they're getting a lot better, and actually, um, it, it, they're probably now better in when you've got good quality images than a human an average human being i still be, still remain to be convinced whether they're better than super recognizers and in fact we've got some research going on at the moment but this is somebody now you probably think you recognize this person and although the more tricks i do in my talks the less um people fall for them and of course it's a blurred image of someone who looks like barack obama but he's not Barack Obama. It's an entirely different person. And so if you've got a blurred image, anyone can make a mistake. And so can a computer. 
So a computer might have recognised that as Barack Obama as well. And yeah, completely different ethnicity. Um, the National Institute of Science and Technology in the United States, they compared super recognizers, some of them from our sample, some of them I wouldn't have called super recognizers. They think they, their uh, criteria for being a super recognizer was much lower than we use in our research. But, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes but because we've had 7 million people take part in our research. It's not been that difficult for us to find super recognizers. If you've only got a small sample, it's very, very difficult, especially if American police don't have super recognizers. You've got no police to ask either. So but what they found was they were testing the best algorithms in the world, comparing them with super recognizers. And they found that there was no significant difference in accuracy between super recognizer and the best in 2017 it was. Um, but both were far superior on this trial test, test than controls. What they really found that was interesting, though, and this is why I keep saying, if you're going to have computers, which are politically disputed by some, actually, if you combined a computer with a super recognizer, the accuracy was even higher. Why? Because most of the time, the mistakes a computer and a human make are pretty much identical. However, sometimes a computer will make a mistake of identification that no human would ever make and vice versa. Um, but what's key here is the advantage was for a super recognizer decision and a computer. If you put a control with a computer, there was very, very little increase at all. Again, this supports the idea that if you are wanting to protect innocent people, uh, and you are going to use these systems and you know they're going to make some mistakes in advance, then bring a super recognizer in to be the operator because they can make an immediate decision. And as I said, um, there is a company I've worked with, um, and I'm not allowed to say who they are, who do just that. They, 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 they have um, super recognizers we've identified as being some of the best. We've, they're members of the public, not, not police. They work with these systems. Um, I'm going to leave that one because I think that's probably enough. I have a book. It's a little bit old now, 2015. I have a website and I have a email address if anyone wants the slides. Um, and that's probably it from me. I'm hoping someone's listening. Thank you very much. Oh, there's some references afterwards.